Number 8. In the Crucible with Christ, 3rd Quarter, 2022. Daniel Duda. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're starting our class, Lesson 8, Seeing the Invisible in the Crucible with Christ quarter. Dr. Daniel Duda is our moderator, and Jim is going to offer our opening prayer. Our kind Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the people who are gathered here. And we pray that Daniel will lead us into glorifying your character today, and that not only will we speak of the glory of your character, but that we will learn to reflect it as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. So, hello to everybody, and glad to see you all. We are dealing with Lesson 8, and by the way of introduction, let me say that with this lesson, we leave the models of theodicy. This is how do we justify or how do we argue that God is good and powerful in spite of the evil which is prevailing in the world. And we enter the how-to aspect of how to live when things are not going well, or in the words of the quarterly when we are in the crucible. Now, the challenges that we are going to have is how do we distill principles that can be useful, but refrain from giving recipes? Remember when Job's friends start explaining to Job what is going on and giving him recipe, what he should do and how he should behave, then that's where he says, you are miserable counselors. You are not very helpful to me. I am not fallen from light further than you are. So if you are getting this, be sure I am getting it too. And so the danger of becoming Job's friend when someone is in a difficult situation and giving the recipe how to handle it, it's real. So when they were there with him and cried and made sure their presence is known, then they have been helpful. Once they opened up their mouth, they were not so helpful. Now, that does not, of course, mean that we should not say anything and For helping professions during their training, there are ways how we teach these people how to be helpful to people in difficult situations. Secondly, how do we make sure that these principles are based on a serious or responsible way of reading the Bible text? So rather than importing into text or reading into the text our preconceived ideas, how do we make sure that those principles are based on the Bible text? Because what I think, what you think is irrelevant, you and I are not inspired. Bible authors are inspired. So there is value in what they are saying. But because they are not saying it to us, we need to bridge the gap between the time and culture and place so that it's meaningful for us, although it was not said directly to us. Now, as you know, in most Sabbath school classes, people don't need the Bible text to get the day's portion of blessing. As long as they have a share of whining and moaning and grumbling, they will go home pretty satisfied that yeah, they got it off their chest. And the fact that they didn't learn anything new from the Bible, it's not bothering them too much. So I have a gripe why you call it a school, because a school is a place where you are supposed to learn something. You should call it Sabbath school kindergarten. This is where you spend time while your parents are at work so that we don't release you into the evil world where you'll be in danger, but you have a good time. And so, and the first dilemma is our memory text, because the text is not then related to or referred to anywhere else in the lesson. And so the dilemma for the teachers who are listening now Friday night, okay, what do I do tomorrow? Please help me. (laughs) Is do I take it first because it's there on Sabbath afternoon or do I take it last because it can be a nice way of concluding the lesson? Now in the lesson, the memory text functions as a ski jump, you know, so Hebrews 11.27. By faith, he left Egypt unafraid of the king's anger, for he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. So in those classes where the teacher is not so much in control or in charge, or where you don't have the discipline to devote the last 10 minutes to application and to pulling things together, my suggestion is that you take it first. If you have a good discipline and you can manage the class well and go to the application, then of course, it will be more effective when you take it last. So if you look under number two, what makes Moses a hero of faith? Because Terry, and you have noticed the text she read was from Hebrews 11, and this is the chapter of the heroes of faith. 
So what was it about Moses? What is the text saying that makes him a hero of faith? John Robson? When I read that section of Hebrews, I didn't think it actually answered the question. So I didn't see that anything told us why he was a hero of faith. It says he has faith, but it doesn't. Moses left Egypt because he was afraid of Pharaoh, surely. I felt there's a little bit of license, New Testament license being given by the writer of Hebrews. Okay, interesting. Robert? He was a hero because he followed God even though he couldn't see him. Yes. So what does it mean that he followed God, although he would not be able to see him? That applies to everybody who ever lived. Yeah. So, and it has something to do with the fact that he can look into the future, that he can rely that there is a providence of God, that God is able to supply or do something better than what we could accomplish or see for ourselves. Now, can you see why this is meaningful to the first listeners or readers of the letter to Hebrews? Why this fact that don't look at the present difficult situation. Remember, these are believers from Judaism, from Jews, who 30 years after Christ disappeared, are under increasing pressure from fellow Jews that they forsaken the religion of patriarchs and prophets, and they followed a rabbi who is a carpenter, not a proper trained rabbi in the rabbinical schools, and who has not been seen for the last 30 years, and some fishermen. And because of this, they are seen as traitors of their nation, of their religion. And so they have their houses plundered. They have their property taken away. They are persecuted. They are in a difficult situation. They lost the position in the society in the community, and in the religious world of the day. So why is the author of Hebrews pointing, but look at Moses. When he was in a situation, he could look into the future, not only things which are seen, but also those which are not seen. Henry? I have always struggled with this text because it doesn't seem to speak very clearly at the beginning that he forsook Egypt rather voluntary, but actually because of the consequences. To save his skin. So when he realized that he's in trouble. Exactly. But what I have been trying to identify is what was the author meaning with forsook Egypt? Was he meaning that he fled from uh, Egypt because he was scared? Or was he meaning that he decided to stand on the side of the Jews when he was still in the palace, when he went and defended a Jew and was looking inside of the Jew campment and seeing how bad they were treated, at that time, he is taking a position. He is leaving Egypt behind, even though he is living in there under the protection of Pharaoh's daughter, and he's making a stand, he's standing on the side of the Jews inside. Well, later on, yes, he fears, but that was an act of bravery, I believe. That was an act of faith. The story that he has been told from his family, we rescue, we put you on the river, God has protected you, and God is with us, he's going to be the deliverer. That is what resonated in his mind to take the stand on the Jews' side. That's what I have been trying to understand with that text. Yeah. So the first question there is, are we talking about him running away when he killed the Egyptian and he realizes that the matter is known and he's in trouble with the law? Or are we talking about when he leads out Egyptians against the furious anger, the wrath of the king, believing that God will protect them and the Pharaoh who is going to persecute them cannot harm them. Yes. So the important thing there is you have heard these stories about a person who lives in a sheltered environment, uh, well-to-do, and at one point they decide to walk away from it. You remember the story of Francis and the Franciscans where he leaves something behind. And so Moses is an example of someone who abandoned the life of privilege because he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, grew up in the royal court, yet he knew where he came from, what is his true identity, and he is not afraid to walk out of these privileges and to share into something which is not going to enhance his status as he had it. John? One way I can see that Moses leaves Egypt 
in his early adult life when he kills the Egyptian is to combine three aspects, righteous deeds that Moses does as he leaves Egypt. He kills the Egyptian, he intervenes in the argument between the two Israelites and stands up for the underdog, presumably there, and then he also intervenes and protects the women of the well when he arrives at his then future father-in-law's house, Jethro's house. So he defends, he does what is right. He doesn't put himself, talked about the pyramid, being the person at the top of the pyramid exerts themselves and takes advantage of others. Moses represents the underdog in these three cases. And I think my understanding of the story is that God sees someone he can work with here. Yes. Thank you, John. And if you notice what follows after verse 27, which is the memory text, the author of Hebrews connects this with the Exodus, the experience of Exodus. So when Egypt is devastated by plagues, which allows or permits Israelites to leave the country, Pharaoh is angry and Moses decides to leave. Pharaoh is pursuing them with the army, but Moses relies on invisible God. Remember a reference back to Hebrews 11.1. 1. So he can relate to something that is not seen. Bob? How close were the Israelites at this point to God? Because it seems like there was some discussion later in Exodus that they had somewhat forgotten some of the things because they had to have almost a revival. So were they conscious very acutely of their special role or had the majority somewhat forgotten who they were and they had to almost relearn it? Yeah, That's a good question. You know, after 200 years of slavery, probably what this is going to be, you know how they are going to react at every difficult situation. They are going to blame Moses or God or both for the situation in which they are. So it's obvious, Bob, that the spiritual maturity reflects the centuries of slavery and no one teaching them about their religion and the status and the God they serve, etc. Sean? Yes, thank you. If the language, the English translation is accurate in verse 24, several of the translations that I've looked at uses the word that Moses refused. He refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter. If that's an accurate translation, it would imply to me that he came to a very significant moment in his life. Somebody had been pressing him from the outside, if not having the internal pressure of making a fixed and final decision about his identity as a person, um, but also his relationship to God. And I think that that has some parallel to the moments in our own lives where we have to make these magnificent decisions that will give direction for the rest of our lives. So the lesson there is that he can look beyond the present circumstances into the future. And that's why it's important, because in the world in which you and I live, it's easy to be desperate, it's easy to be disorientated, it's easy to feel, wow, everything is falling apart and falling down. But if you have this capacity when you are in the crucible, when you are in the difficult situation, to look beyond what you see, that there is caring and loving God, and there is still a future, then you are a hero of faith. Lou? He spent his early childhood with his mother, who was apparently a very believing, strong, relationship-oriented woman who taught him principles and who God is. And I think those things never really left Moses. I think they were there. You know, Mrs. White says, train up a child. And his mother had that privilege. Even though he was exposed to all the Egyptian glamour and riches and everything else, it was not satisfying to Moses. And God had, of course, a purpose and was leading him through the Holy Spirit as well. Okay, thank you. So we can go to the first part. And the first part is Romans 8. So let's read Romans 8, 28 to 39. So here are the four or five things that we should look at when we are in a difficult situation. And the first one is the goodness of the Father or God. Romans 8, 28 to 39. 
We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. Larry? Most the translations start the paragraph break or thought break at verse 28, but the New English Bible combines that and starts it at verse 26, where it talks about the Spirit helping us, and then it leads right into, and it's through this that all things work together, which, as I read it without understanding the actual way Greek is structured, that to me changes entirely how I should look at everything else that follows. So I was just curious, is that in the natural? Because I didn't see too many other versions that did that. So thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Of course, you know that the early manuscripts were all written in capital letters, and they are just going. There are no paragraphs, no breaking. And so this breaking it into paragraphs and even supplying the headings, it's all the work of translators to make it easier for you to understand. There's nothing inspired about that. And we have a few times discussed how the division into chapters reflects the journey on a horse from Paris to Lyon. And in a few places, <laughs> it's easy to see a better division would be more helpful to understanding of the text. So it's up to the translators how they divide it. And as Larry pointed out, if you see the connection with what's going on in preceding verses, the work of the Spirit, and of course, the decay of creation and the groaning, then it helps you to see the meaning. What is Paul trying to say here to address the issue? Now, the tendency when difficult things happen or things that you don't like in your life or don't appreciate is if you are on the receiving end to start wondering whether God really loves you. Because if he did, then things are not supposed to be like this. A few times when we talked about fathering, I pro quoted to you the story from Donald Miller. The original version of the book was To Own a Dragon. The revised edition, it's called Father Fiction. And because Donald Miller did not grow up in a family with a father present, he lives with this teacher and he watches how he treats his wife and his daughter. And it's a, an amazing learning experience to him. And at one point, he quotes this cute story about his little daughter who wants to eat chicken wings. And the father does not allow her to eat as many chicken wings as she wants because he feels that he, she should eat also some other things. And she says to him in a dramatic voice, I can't believe that you are doing this to me, you know. And so the tendency is to feel like saying to God, I can't believe you are doing this to me. And while it's cute in that little girl, it's not that cute in the lives of mature adult people. Because, of course, when you are overwhelmed emotionally, it's easy to think that God is doing this to you and to take it personally. But that's not the reality. So this is what you experience on the receiving end. Now, if you are 
in the situation of someone who has a close person, a relative, a friend, who is going through hard time, the tendency is to say, oh, just hang out there, it will all turn out well. And of course, the question is, how do you know? Now, if the Lord told you yesterday night, go and visit so-and-so and tell him, her, that the things are going to turn out well, then, yep, do what the Lord asks you to do. But if the Lord has not spoken to you, then coming and saying to someone, oh, don't worry, everything will be okay. And even Larry quoted it, all things work for good. Really? Do they? Because that's not what the Greek says. All right, back to Larry and then Dan Kido. In our Western culture, If a problem is occurring on a Sabbath, it darn well better be resolved by next Sabbath or heads are going to roll. So to have a crisis go on week after week is just, I mean, that's unheard of in our way of thinking. And that made me think back on my life. I went through a really rough period of time that once I understood that I was in a rough period, I was in there for like five years before I even acknowledged and understood where I was. It was another 13 years before things kind of got worked through. And I used to read about Moses and the 40 years from the time that we just discussed his event where he left Egypt. At the time, I always thought Moses wasn't ready, but probably God wasn't ready. And Moses just jumped the gun. And God wasn't willing to fast forward the world 40 years to get it on Moses's time. So maybe that's the dilemma that we have to confront. And how do I do that when I need it resolved by next Sabbath because my house will be foreclosed on Friday if it's not? Yeah. And of course, it's the culture in which we live. Hollywood is to some degree or large degree responsible for that because you start watching a movie and within 90 minutes or 120 minutes, the plot is resolved and you see the final cast and who played whom, you know, going there and the problem solved and very few serious problems in life resolved that quickly. It was interesting you mentioned 13 years, which of course was how long it took Joseph. So he's 17 when he sold to Egypt and his troubles start and he's 30 when he becomes the prime minister and his troubles are resolved. So it took 13 years. And that's why the story of Exodus is one of the key stories of the Old Testament of the Pentateuch, where God says, I have heard the cry. I have seen the tears. I know what's going on, yet it takes a few generations. And so... Yet they spent over 200 years in slavery. Yes, there is 430 years since the promise to Abraham to the experience of Exodus. And so this idea or this impatient thing that, you know, things should resolve within 30 minutes in our lives. And if not, something is seriously broken and the heads should roll and God is not doing a good job. Yeah, you didn't get it from reading the Bible. You got it from the culture in which you live. One of the kiddos. This group of texts is among my favorite parts of the Bible because I have found it actually quite comforting. It's because I look at it, I've looked at it in two ways. In one way, I realize that God is with me no matter what's happening. And then at the end of the process, whether it's 13 years or however long it may be, I know that I will have grown and that of all the things that God would like for me to do is grow. And there's a variety of reasons why I feel that way. But the other thing, it also gives me comfort that when I have someone as powerful and as resourceful as God on my side, that I don't have to worry if the other side has unusual resources and has seemingly everything on their side to win if I am maintaining what I consider to be doing what God will. And so it has maybe given me a certain restfulness or a certain amount of, I wouldn't say not caring when those things happen. But at least it gives me an overall feeling of peace with what I'm doing. And so, as I said, I find these verses very, very reassuring and helpful in my daily life. Okay, thank you, Dan. And I hope you have noticed, the rest of you, that he was speaking in first person, that I find it. I know that when I will later look back, I have grown and I appreciate that in my own experience because that's what I'm ultimately interested in. I'm more interested in growing than in having a comfortable life. So this is very helpful that this is a lesson that you take from it. 
but be very careful to bring this to a person in a situation of suffering and say to them, actually, it shouldn't hurt you very much because God is trying to teach you a lesson. And 15 years or 13 years from now, you will see it differently. Maybe yes, <laughs> maybe no, but hopefully yes. But that is not very helpful to them in that current situation. When you are in a difficult situation, the question is, where do you look? So you feel overwhelmed, and we have some good remarks in the chat. You are overwhelmed by your emotions. The clear message is, I don't like this. I am not enjoying it. And the danger is that you are trying to process it in light of your emotional experience, that what you feel is going to determine what you see there. Which brings us back to the Bible text. So if you look under number three, how many times you and I have heard it quoted? Oh, don't worry. Just remember, all things work for good. I know that if you have the King James Version of the Bible, that's what the King James Version says. But remember, it's not the King James Version that is inspired. It's from 17th century, 1611. And the best Greek manuscripts say, God in all things works for good for those who love him. The text does not say, oh, just hang on there. Everything is going to work out all right. No, there are situations, if you look under number nine, there are situations in which maybe you or somebody from your family or somebody that you know, they went through things that did not work out, bad things that they feared happened, even worse than they could imagine. Their prayers have not been heard as much as they could say. And yet, there is some hope. And the hope is not in the fact that the things will work out. The hope is that God, in spite of circumstances, works through what we go through. So somehow he can turn that into something useful. Okay, Colette. One thing that has been really helpful in my situation when I've been working through some trauma issues is for someone to say to me, what do you need right now? And I think that's what God did for Jesus in Gethsemane when he was fainting on the ground. What did he need right then? You know, God sent the angel. He sent him the strength for what he needed for the moment. And when God looks at us and he makes his promise that he's going to walk with us, he doesn't promise me that he'll give me what I need for next week. He promises me what he'll give me for today. And for myself and for other people that I have known that have been going through some really difficult things, what do you need? right now? What do you need for today? And what can we pray for right now? What kind of God's strength do we need? And I think that's the biggest encouragement we can offer people instead of saying, oh, it'll all work out in the end. Because like you've been saying, sometimes it doesn't all work out in the end. And yet, what do we need right now to make it through to another day, to make it through to the next hour? And that's where God comes in and goes, I'm here. I am the God of now. I am your God that will give you the strength that you need to make it through. Yes, don't try to take it all on your shoulders. You have available what you need for the next hour. You have available for you need for now. And in this context, verse 32 is crucial, as we have indicated also there at the end of question number three. In the Message Bible, if God did not hesitate to put everything online for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, Is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? So the question is, where do you look when you are in that situation, when you are overwhelmed by your emotions? And the tendency is, as we mentioned, is to say, I can't believe you are doing this to me, you know, is to look at ourselves and our condition and what I feel. And verse 32 is telling us, if he did not withhold his own son by gave him up for all of us, will he not with him give us also everything else? Now, of course, uh, as a teacher, I would say, could you elaborate on everything else? (laughs) Does everything else mean that the situation is going to change within the next five minutes or that the situation is going to have a positive outcome from the perspective of the 5th of February or uh, 13th of August? No, but where do you look? And don't look at your emotions, how you feel about it now. A responsible way is to look elsewhere. I am not the only one that goes through a difficult situation in life. God himself went through the difficult situation when he gave up his beloved son, his only son. Jesus went through a difficult situation. And this is for us an assurance, a guarantee that there will be a safe or 
helpful arrival, although things may not be resolved from the perspective of the 5th of February or 15th of August, the way we want them to be resolved. Let's go to Iris. So if it's not the emotions that are triggered by the circumstances that we anchor ourselves in, then it has to be the truth about God. Yes. That's, I think, the relevance of these texts, that contrary to what we feel, and these feelings are very normal, and they are very appropriate and matching often the circumstances, but we need sort of that second leg that is anchored in what do I know to be true about God? And even though I feel like he has just abandoned me, he ha- my situation may have escaped under his radar, or <laughs> those are lies. <laughs> and they need to be exposed as such and rejected. And I need to embrace in those moments what I know to be true, and that is that God will never leave or forsake me that he will be walking through the darkness with me, that he has a thousand solutions where my eye doesn't see one, and that he will be faithful in whatever way. And I must say, Colette's perspective of the great controversy to see that it is not God who is inflicting these things, but that in a war type of situation in which we find ourselves, it shouldn't be a total surprise that Satan attacks us and that he does this very well and often where we are most vulnerable. Not a surprise, but the truth is also that when he dares to do that, He is attacking God, (laughs) and there is a loving God who stands by our side, who knows, and who is ultimately always working out his redemptive ways. Doesn't mean that this side of eternity, there are not consequences that are severe, you know, but his grace will somehow go through with us. And I think that's what we can hold on to and encourage people to hold on to, and then also sit with the tension that it is often a process especially when something very, very hideous is happening, to regain that perspective again. Yes, thank you. Bob Kern says in the chat, aren't difficult situations there for our own character building? And of course, this is the model of theodicy, which is this soul development, soul character building. Yes, just please don't tell it to the suffering person, because that's not what they need to hear, and that's not what is going to help them. So this is what you can see ex post with hindsight, but this is not what the suffering person needs to hear. And if you tell them, you are not helping them. Larry? I was looking at the modern language Bible. Is it possible that phrase that we've been discussing is conditional instead of just a claim item in the Bible that we can just go to find the promise and claim it and therefore it's ours? Because it seems to make this read that that's a very conditional statement. I don't know the language and the settings. I have different English interpretations of what it means, and so I'm trying to make sense out of all of it. I mean, the problem is of the operating system. So if your approach is that I use the promises so that I get myself out of the difficult situation which I don't enjoy, the center of attention is me. It's incredibly self-centered. And it's back to, I can't believe why are you doing this to me? And as it was mentioned in the chat, and uh, Iris said it very clearly, we are in a planet which is at war. There are a multiplicity of factors that influence what is happening. God is not doing this to you. When I am asking, why are you doing this to me? How come that nobody asks, and why is this happening to God? Why is this happening in his universe? He's so kind, so gracious to everybody. He blesses people, sends his reign on good and evil, etc. Why is this happening to him? in his universe. So the tendency is to ask this, uh, you know, I don't like this. How do I get out of this as soon as possible? And given the culture and the situation that we kill the pain as soon as possible so that we are not exposed to it, etc. Let me assure you, it's perfectly normal to feel this, but let's not allow our outlook on the situation and God be determined by what I feel, let's turn our attention to what we know that is true. Remember, Jesus says, we are going to Jerusalem, I am going to be mistreated, but then he adds, but on the third day, I am going to be resurrected. So this is what he knows, and he tells what he gets from the larger perspective, larger view. Now, this does not prevent him, when he gets to Gethsemane, 
to feel miserable and to say, Peter, James, John, come, where are you? I need you. I feel like dying. My soul is sad unto death. He's not afraid to talk about his feelings. Naomi says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara because my life has been bitter. And the temptation of us pious Christians is to jump in and say, Naomi, you can't even talk like this. Instead of saying, Naomi, what you are going through is perfectly normal. Remember, God says to Job, we in heaven understand why you talk the way you did. Your friends did not. His friend says, I wouldn't talk like this to God. I would not give him a chance to kill me. He's telling him, if you keep talking like this, you are risking that God is going to zap you. So watch out your mouth and don't say what you feel. Now, that's the worst advice you can get because one of the laws of emotions is if you want to deal with your emotions in a healthy way, you need to get them off the system. You need to talk about that. Now, but as we mentioned in the class before, and we need to move on. And I refer you to the next lesson. We are going to talk about ABC of emotions in the next lesson. And so you will get a different perspective on this one. But let's say it's perfectly normal what you are feeling, what you are going through. But if you process it from your emotional standpoint, you are not going to arrive at clear, mature, balanced perspective. Your mind, your perspective is clouded by what you are feeling. Sean, I think there's great relevance in moving to the section five as a great segue and to talk about escapism in this context. I had three very dramatic and powerful conversations this last week. In fact, all three based in what I understand to be their experience with escapism. They're all very sound Christian people who have quite a narrow view of the plan of salvation, a very legal view, and they're struggling with difficult situations in their life. And the first question, all three of them, the first question they posed to me to try to help them was, why is God doing this? Why did God allow that? Why, why, why in reference to God? And I hope that I did not fall into what you have been counseling us to not fall into, I did not offer them any suggested solutions. I simply embraced them and told them I wanted to be a friend for them as we journey forward. But I think this is a relevant conversation for Christians in general, but particularly Seventh-day Adventist Christians who, if I understand where you want to go with this notion of escapism, who are involved in escapist theology, I think it's a relevant conversation and segue from our last section here. Yes, and we also covered this in the previous lesson, lesson number seven, when we talk about the book of Job. So the fact that people are asking why, 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 once again, it's perfectly normal. It's man's search for meaning. Because we feel as long as I know why, then it's easier to bear. But remember, when Job is asking, why is this happening to me? God does not respond to him, Job. This is very simple. Just imagine a huge H and there is an upper level and this is what happened on the upper level and this is what you are experiencing on the lower level. No, he gives him a different answer because the answer why is not what is ultimately going to help him. He needs something else. Now, the genius of Adventism is that Adventism tells you that if God does not provide a satisfactory why, by the end of millennium, he has not won the war. We still have a problem. But the problem is, if I insist from the perspective of the 5th of February or 15th of August, when the lesson will be discussed, that I know the answer why, it's back to that five-year-old, <laughs> I can't believe why you are doing this to me. I can't eat all chicken wings that I want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I really need to give you a lecture on nutrition in order for you to be blessed? Just come here. I love you. <laughs> you know, as Iris said, God is not going to forsake you. He provides all that you need for this situation. Where are you looking? And Romans 8 says, what's happening to you is not that unique that nobody in the history of humankind went through. Jesus went through something which was much worse. God is there. Don't judge God, his love and care by what is happening to you from how you feel right now. 
you can be sure he's there with you. Hopefully there are other Christians, other fellow believers who put their arms around you so that you can see a human face, a human touch, etc. Remember in New Testament, this one another, this care and empathy coming alongside is the duty of everybody. It's what we do to one another. That's why we have the community. That's why God sends us to a community. So you can get over that slump in your feelings because of somebody putting their arms around you. And then we will deal with why <laughs> when it is appropriate, either later or during the millennium when your operating system and capacity will be much greater and better to process things which you were not able to process from that perspective. And God might even encourage you when you say, okay, I have no more questions to ask, that God will say, and what about that prayer that you prayed when you were eight years old and you never got answered? You still didn't ask about that. Are you afraid <laughs> to ask? So let's explore that one. You know, let's talk about that one. Because the genius of the great controversy model is that in order to win the war, God needs to win the mind. He needs to answer the questions. And the whole creation needs to say, you have not overstepped yourself. You have conducted yourself blamelessly. Now I understand why. I didn't understand it then in February 22. I didn't understand it in August 22, but now I understand it. Now I am perfectly satisfied. Now I can see, I can connect the dots the way I was not able to connect them at that time. All right, let's go. So the first thing, what do you do? And the question is, where do you look? Don't look at what you are feeling right now. Look at the larger perspective. Look at the bigger picture. Don't judge who God is by what is happening to you now. Judge it from the perspective of what the Holy Spirit does. In your experience, you are still groaning, and we will still be groaning this side of eternity. But the Holy Spirit is on your side. The Father is on your side. Jesus is on your side. He went through something which was much worse than what you are going through. Okay, Monday's lesson is quoting John 14, 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And I tell you under number four, this is likely the most frequently misquoted text in the history of the Bible and humankind. And because it's a blank check, we even incorporate it into the ending of our prayers. And we ask all this, not in our name, not in our merits, but in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So what do we mean when we say, and we ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. What did Jesus mean when he said, if you ask anything in my name, it's going to happen? Iris. Well, that raises the question, what does it mean in my name? God's name. Jesus' name stands for his character, for who he is. So I think in the moment I say that, I am highlighting, I'm underscoring the kind of God that God is. I'm reminding myself that he is a God who is all about love, showing kindness, trying to save to the uttermost. And I don't think it is a magic formula to twist God's arm to do what he wouldn't do otherwise. And how do you know that? We all agree with you. That, so that how do you know that it's not an out-of-jail card? It's not a magic formula to twist God's hand so that I get <laughs> what I want, ultimately. Yeah, It defeats everything I know to be true about God, who reasons with us, who is not a machine where you plug in the right formula on the one side and get a result on the other. And the truth is, I have to also embrace my own limitations, my own limit in seeing things right. Thank God he didn't answer all my prayers in the way I wanted them at the time. But that even in my limited ability to even offer prayers to him, to even intercede, I can embrace that these prayers are in the hands of a trustworthy God, that he will lead me in no other way than I would want to be led if I knew the end from the beginning. An inspired lady once said that, something like that. Yes. So I think it is really the character of God that we are embracing the truth about God. And that gives us a sense of confidence, even when disaster strikes, when life is uncertain, when we don't know our way around. We know that our whatever we give to God is safe in his hands. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Now, 
you know that a text without a context is a pretext, is a ski jump. So you can't take verse 14 out of the context. And what is the context of John 14? John 14 says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Why? <laughs> because it's normal in this fallen world that circumstances are going to happen that are going to trouble your heart. Don't feel you are a bad Christian. Remember, Jesus is a male who notoriously have hard time to share their emotions, yet he is not afraid to say, Peter, James, Jones, where are you guys? I need you. Let me tell you how I feel. I feel overwhelmed by what is happening to me and my soul. Now, and instead of saying, wait a minute, didn't you tell us three times that you are going to come victorious through this, that you are going to be resurrected? Where is your faith? <laughs> Why are you talking like this? No, there is no direct connection between what we know and what we feel. Emotions are not classically conditioned. You are going to feel what you are going to feel if you go through a certain experience. So if you go through experience of a loss, you are going to feel grief. If you go through experience of being threatened, if your world is falling apart, falling down, you are going to experience fear. If you are blocked in reaching your goal, whether it's a traffic jam that you can't be at work on time and you are in trouble with your boss or being seen as a conscientious and hard and good worker, you are going to feel anger and resentment. So let not your heart be troubled, but let me tell you, I am working on the mansions. God is at work. And as long as you understand his character, as you have put there in the chat, things are going to fall into perspective that will help you to deal with this. So if you ask anything in my name, it is going to happen. It's not an out-of-jail card, you know, a magic formula how to get all you want, because then you are God, then you are in charge. It's a reference if you look at the character of God, if you look at what he is doing, what the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son are doing on your behalf, you are going to get a different perspective on this. Now, how do we know this is what Jesus meant vis-a-vis -vis the charismatic interpretation of these texts? Look at Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5 or 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Okay, so in the days of his flesh, Jesus had a certain preference how he wanted his life to go. And when he realized that it's going differently, that he is going to end up on a cross. And remember, that was the way to deter people rebelling against the Roman Empire. That was the most prolonged painful death that human beings invented in order to discourage the rebellion against the empire. He offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears so that he is saved from death. And listen to what Hebrew says. And he got a positive answer to his prayer. And he was hurt. That means nothing bad happened to him? No, he died. Yet Hebrews can say, but he got a positive answer to his prayer. And it wasn't that Jesus forgot to take his own medicine and add at the end of his prayer, and I ask this in your name, you know. You know how many times I have heard people saying when a tragedy struck, I remember when I was in Russia, we had some pastors returning from a pastoral meeting and a truck hit the car and all, I think, four pastors sitting in that car were killed. You can be sure somebody is going to say, probably they forgot to pray that morning for the production. Or if they prayed, they forgot to say at the end of their prayer, and we ask this in my name, meaning that's a magical formula that is not going to happen. And that's not what the Bible promises. The Bible says the same Jesus who gives you this formula, if you ask in my name, is going to happen. The Bible says he offered prayers formulated them better than any one of us humans can formulate because he was so close with his father. He offered supplications, see the endearing and strong word with loud cries and tears, and yet the outcome was what it was. Acts 12, verses 1 and 2. About that time, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. So, which fate do you want? Do you want the fate of James or Peter? Read on, and there is a story of Peter in chapter 12. Now, was it that James forgot to pray in the name of Jesus in the morning, and Peter did? So, in one chapter, you have two stories. James, who is the brother of John, James Zebedee, 
and he's beheaded. And you have Peter. The angels are even oiling the cogs of the gate so that the guards do not wake up. And the angel escorts him out of the inner prison. The chains are not a problem. The gate is not a problem. The soldiers are not a problem. And he's saved. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, if you are human, you say, I want this and not that. Just like with the ice cream. Give me this, not that one. But it's not that one prayed the right prayer with the right ending and the other did not. There's something else going on. And by the way, the same applies to Paul. And you have the reference there in 2 Timothy 4. So Paul gets beheaded as well. He says, I have talked to the Lord about the problem that I had. And God said, enough. I don't want to hear any more prayers about that. And it's not that you did not add the proper ending at the end, but it's not going to happen. So here are scriptural references that tell you how to understand John 14. Not only the immediate context of John 14, but the larger context of the New Testament. Done? I think this is one of the conditional texts. And the condition is that if we ask to grow spiritually, God will answer those prayers. I, at one time in my life sort of tested this, and I decided I would not go on with that. And the reason why is I found that God was very quick to answer those prayers that I asked about whatever spiritual thing I would like to enhance myself, because it was usually quite painful, and it occurred relatively quickly. On the flip side, I find that if I don't ask for anything, that God will still direct my growth, and it will not be as painful as it would be if it was done my way. So I've learned not to utilize this text, because I'd rather that God guide my growth, not necessarily myself. But I think if interpreted this way, it conditionally, I think it works, at least for me. Okay, good. I would be personally careful with that conditional aspect because it can easily convey to people that somehow on top of the problem of the difficulty they go through, they go through the experience, okay, so obviously I did not fulfill the conditions. So once again, the blame, the failure is on my part. But philosophically, of course, you are right. Just be careful how you convey this to other people who are going through a difficult period of suffering, because though philosophically right, it might not be the most helpful. Larry? There are little things that you pray for, like help me find the keys. You know, you talk about getting to work on time and all of that. And yes, those things frustrate you, but oftentimes the prayer just helps you refocus your thinking into something else. But one of the things back to this text in Romans, is it conceivable that when we bring ourselves to read that whole thing in context, that the good that's referred to there really is you redirect your thinking. Before you pray or in the process of praying, my thinking, and this is how it's happened in my life, so I only can assume that this must happen for other people as well, my thinking changes. And I've learned that it's very important for me not only to be careful what I think about, but to be careful how I think about what I think about. Otherwise, I go completely down the wrong road and it becomes extremely rational for me to drive the wrong way on the freeway if I started out thinking about this incorrectly. It seems like it's much more complicated as I listen to you than what I thought it was before we started. And this is the problem of Job's friends who say, oh, Job, there must be a secret sin somewhere which you did not manage to confess. So just scratch your head, come up with the confess. Everything will be all right. You know, magical solution. Now, you are excused if you believe in magical solution when you are three or five years old, because you don't have the capacity to (laughs) deal with the complexities of life. But you are not excused if you are 21 or 51 or beyond, if you still believe in magical solution. And as I always I always tell the students, I do believe in miracles, but I don't believe in magic. I believe in God who can do miracles in 21st century, in 20 and 22. But if you still have magical thinking, if you still have this operation system of Job's friends, then there is something immature there. And as Pete Scazzaro tells us, and we quoted many times, there is no spiritual growth without emotional growth. Bob Ziprick. There's some other verses in the Bible about the thousands shall fall on one side and 10,000 on the other. And I'm thinking that sometimes good people are included in the thousand that are falling or the 10,000, like the ministers you mentioned who were killed. It doesn't mean they're bad necessarily. They were doing something wrong, but I was trying to think how to work those verses in with this lesson. You know the verses I'm referring to. 
Yes, of course, Psalm 90. So it's a psalm for the time of trouble, where those who are in the hiding of the Most High will survive and the wicked will not be able to kill them. But that does not apply from the perspective of the 5th of February or 15th of August. So yes, when the close of probation has taken place, if you are in the hiding of the Most High, then 1,000 will fall on your side and 10,000 on your left side. But God will not allow you to go down there. But you and I know many good soldiers of God who went down and the text did not apply to them. And if you use simplistic operating system, that's what happens when people go through a difficult experience like Holocaust and they suddenly realize that it cannot be about claiming the promises. So, yeah. And if you just concentrate on claiming the promises and it's going to take you down the rabbit hole and the end is going to be tragic. So you need to grow up and understand the complexity of the world in which you live. Now, of course, if you are in a difficult situation and you claim the promise and all of us have those experiences, I can give you a number of them, miraculous, from living under communism where the situation was incredibly difficult, almost impossible to anyone who lived in a free world to imagine. And you know, if God does not deliver now, there's going to be a, a sad end. And I can give you examples of me crying, having had those miraculous experiences when God does not deliver, because he wants to teach you something else. And yeah, you need to upgrade your operational system. So if you are on Apple, it's 15.4. If you are on Windows, it's 11. And if you are still on MS-DOS 3.3, it's time to upgrade. If you look at the experience of Jesus, Apostle James, the brother James Zebedee, if you look at the experience of Paul, it's not that James failed to say his prayers and only Peter did. It's not that Paul was something deficient. He says, I have kept the faith till the end, yet he's going to be beheaded. The world is still groaning and we will groan with it. You can't escape it. But God is with us in all this groaning and he actively works on our behalf and for our good. All right, let's go to the next one. The power of resurrection, Ephesians 1, 18 to 23. So that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among saints? And what is the immeasurable goodness of his power for us who believe? According to the working of his great power, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So what is the meaning of this power, this power of resurrection? How can that help you when you are in a difficult situation? What is it that Paul is saying here in Ephesians? It's easy to assume that these are happening because God is not powerful enough. I mean, that's the argument of theodicy. If God is good or if God is powerful, then I should not be going through these experiences. And what Paul is saying in Ephesians, if you want to know how powerful is God, look at the greatest display of God's power that the world has ever seen. And that is not in your experience. That is in the experience of where do you see the greatest display of God's power, Cross. according to Paul? On the cross of Calvary. Actually, that's a nice medieval answer. <laughs> but if you look at Ephesians again, yeah, sure, there is an amazing display of God's power. But uh, according to Ephesians 1.20, where do you see that, Rita? The resurrection of Christ. Okay, so can you tell me what makes the resurrection of Christ the greatest display of God's power? Let me ask this way. Is Jesus the first person in history or in the Bible, who was ever resurrected? No. So what makes his resurrection different from the resurrection of Moses, the little girl, Lazarus, the son of the widow of Nain, or a later resurrection, of course, which happened after the resurrection of Jesus, of Dorcas or Eutychus that we read in the book of Acts? How is the resurrection of Jesus different from those reviving experiences. Henry? Yes, I think that it's not on the fact of the resurrection itself, but it's in what it meant, 
when God was willing to demonstrate himself the consequences of sin and not just claiming it because he was the all-powerful, the one in control, that he put himself on test to be judged, that what he was telling at the beginning it was truth, that's the power of humility. See, I'm stepping down, I am demonstrating what nobody wanted to believe, and I am willing to do it myself. To me, that's the power on that, because he was not the only one that was resurrected, and it's just the demonstration that he is giving when he could have just claimed it and demanded to be believed. Okay, thank you. Iris? He was the only one that tasted death without having ever sinned. He was the second Adam. And so while Satan can claim (laughs) that he has a right to keep us dead, (laughs) all those of us who are part of the human family, he did not have that right in, in Christ because Christ never sinned. With him as the second Adam, he brought through the entire descendants of Adam that had sinned and forfeited eternal life. Sure. It's interesting, both philosophical answers and there's depth and truth to it. Larry? While it was easy for him as the creator and the giver of life to raise all of the other people he did while he was alive, he made a statement that he had the power to lay down his life and the power to take it back. I don't know of anybody else who actually has willingly died who could bring themselves back while they're dead. From that perspective, he demonstrated something about himself as his life on earth that I'm going to use the word transcended, the present, the physicalness that we know by here, indicating that while he was in his death state, there was a power of life that still stayed with him. Is that what Paul is trying to write to? To some degree, although I will be careful about the other resurrections that Jesus performed, the resurrections that are based on the fact that he has the power of life. You know, from the children's Sabbath school, yeah, of course, because he's God. Mm, Wait a minute, then it's Paul and Peter who resurrected Eutychus and Dorcas. Are they gods as well? So I would be careful there. But as Jesus said to the lawyer, you are not far from the kingdom. So you are going in the right direction. I just would be a little bit careful about the wording of it, because Jesus did what he did as a human being in dependence on the Father, not as a divine being. And now I leave completely the discussion about the resurrection of Lazarus because of the desire of ages and the insights that we have there. But it's only for those who believe in the prophetic gift of Ellen White. Terry, go ahead. What I'm wondering is first death versus second death. Jesus talks about we're all subject to the first death, which he described regarding Lazarus as a sleep. And we wake up from sleep. Everybody is going to wake up from that first death, the righteous and the unrighteous. I don't know how to describe what I understand of Jesus demonstrating that sin kills. And he came and went through all that to show us, to demonstrate the truth about that. The truth that God really did tell the truth, the truth that God really does know, because the second death is the death from which there is no awakening, although he was awakened. And that's where the metaphor breaks down in my ability to be able to explain it. Yes. And uh, let me put it this way. One of the reasons why so many people download and listen to Pino Sabbath School is not those who are facilitators, but it's you guys as the audience. But listening to you, it's just amazingly mind-broadening experience. And so all four answers that we had were just amazingly philosophical and helpful and taking at the problem from a different angle. But the question is not so difficult as it seems. As I told you, the answer is there in Ephesians 1. (laughs) And so all what you said is just profound, is just amazing. (laughs) Yeah. And there's a kernel of truth in all of what you said. But the answer is there in Ephesians 1. Rita. Other people who had been resurrected were resurrected back to the same life that they came from. But this resurrection, at Christ's death, he was completely separated from God. But God took him back and took him back, as it says 
into the heavenly realm and seated him at his right hand. So that the work that he'd done, he'd come to do, was completed. And he had shown that what the devil had said, everything that the people thought about death, that Satan had misrepresented or had told them about death or that it wouldn't happen, the devil was shown to be a liar and that God was truth and that Christ was God and his work was completed at that point. Yes, so all the other resurrections are basically revival back to life, while this is the only true resurrection. And it's because of this, the reason Jesus is in fact enthroned on the right hand of God, he is taken there, he's over whole cosmos, he starts a new chapter. Now the kingdom of God is part of our reality. There's no question that Exodus was a powerful act, I mean, the Egyptian army is destroyed in the water, so God shows his power. There's no question that return from Babylonian captivity is a demonstration of God's power. But what you see in the resurrection of Jesus is that a new reality of God's kingdom is ushered in. It's like when you look at the night sky with naked eye, you see some stars. But when someone hands you in a powerful telescope, suddenly... As Paul says in verse 17, if you have this fresh gift of wisdom, if you have this telescope through the resurrection of Jesus, you can see the reality. You didn't know it's there. Suddenly there you see stars that you could not see before. And so when you are in a difficult situation, you realize the power of God is at work not on basis how Daniel Duda is doing on 5th of February uh, 2022, but the fact that, as Henry yeah, put it in the chat right now, the ultimate promise of God's reign and kingdom becomes real. And it's real regardless of what I go through in my life today, whether I am up or down. There is a new reality of God's kingdom where Jesus is the right hand of God He is the king and the reality of the kingdom is there. And that's why Paul prays for the church that they see what happened at Easter is now available through Jesus for us to see that this is going on. All right, let's go to 1 Peter 5, 7. So don't measure the reality by what you are going through right now. I had a teacher at the seminary who used to tell us students, when you have diarrhea, don't make far-reaching conclusions about your health. In three days, you will feel different. You know? So look at the prism of Christ being at the right hand of God and the reality of God's kingdom, that Jesus became the king and the kingdom is already here. Yes, we are still groaning. There still will be some negative experiences and God is groaning and the whole creation is groaning with us. But see the bigger reality of the kingdom that became reality during the Easter through the resurrection. First Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Okay. Now, do you realize that this is a quotation from Psalm 55? And Psalm 55 is a perspective of David when he realizes his friend's betrayal. And so when you feel betrayal, when you feel that life is not going the way you want it to go and people around you don't treat you and circumstances don't treat you the way, quote, deserve, unquote, or you expect, how are you going to feel about it? What are you going to say? And of course, part of the book of Psalms is that David is going to say it as he feels it. And so you are not going to quote Psalm 55 very often as a part of liturgy on Sabbath morning, because we do not consider it holy and appropriate enough. Yet it's a psalm of reorientation. So when he comes to the end, he can say, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved, but you, O Lord, cast them down into the lowest pit. The bloodthirsty and treacherous shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. I already told you one of the questions I periodically received when I worked in Russia in 1991 was how come the guy who was in charge of religious persecution under Khrushchev and Brezhnev was still alive in those days over 90 years old. And people always raise that question in the discussions because those righteous who went through difficult times of persecution, they had a hard time 
to understand if the psalm says that they will not live half of their days, how come that this guy is over 90 years old in ripe old age? And what is it that the New Testament quotes from the whole Psalm 55? Peter says, in a strong verb, he says, guys, you need to fling, you need to throw these things on God. Because if you try to deal with this, it's going to wear you down. So you know what you do with these things? Just throw them, fling them on God's back. Let him deal with it. And why can you do that? Because regardless how you feel, and I suggest you reread Psalm 55 to appreciate how David felt, regardless of how you feel, God still cares about you. You may not feel it, but that's the reality. You are going through these emotions. You are normal to feel that. Remember, we don't choose our emotions. You can't avoid feeling that. It is real for you, but the question is, how are you going to deal with these emotions? Are you going to look at the larger reality? Are you going to deal with it in a constructive way? Are you going to see the invisible? Are you going to see the future, as Moses did, in spite of the army behind him, that humanly, militarily speaking, he has no chance of surviving the superpower army, which traps them between the sea, the mountain, or are you going to see the future? And the future is not in hope, in you. The hope is not in your emotions. The future is because he still cares for you. He proved it on the cross. He proved it in the resurrection. Are you going to look at those events that in the story of salvation that prove that God cares about you when you don't feel like he cares about you? So emotions are real. For you are real. You are normal to feel them. You can't avoid feeling it. Don't pretend it's not there. Don't say, oh, everything is great. Everything is wonderful. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. No, it's not. Get it out of the system. Jeremiah says, it's coming. It's going to be ugly. I am not proud of it, but this is how I feel. And when Job gets it, as I said many times, you don't even quote him in the church. We quote his friends because what Job says for us borders on blasphemy. But God says, don't worry. We understand. We in heaven perfect understanding that when you are in this situation, in this emotional distress, this is how you are going to talk. That's perfectly all right. But he still cares for you. All right, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are so thankful that when we are down and when we feel there is no one there in the huge universe who cares and who understands that you are always there and that you are trying to get through that confusion of our emotional state to us and tell us, I know how you feel. I love you, I care for you, and I am there for you. And thank you that there are always people around us that you send into our lives that can put that human touch, human face, and share the burden and ease it so that grief experience is grief halved. And we pray that in coming days and weeks, we might be this type of people for others around us because of what you did for each one of us, comforting us through our difficult times in lives. And thank you that we can play this little part in this great drama of history. And we all look forward to that day when the paradise lost will be paradise regained and all the wise will be answered and we will praise you for eternity because we will understand why things were happening when they were confusing to us. Thank you that we serve a God like that. In Jesus' name. Amen.